Well, good morning to all of you. It's good to see all of you. And I've seen a few faces that I'm like, I haven't seen you in like a year. It's so good uh, to see you. Um, you're going to need a Bible, so why don't you grab it and you can turn to the Gospel of John, and we're going to be in the second half of chapter 10 this morning. A few things that we forgot to mention, VBS registration is open now, so if you saw the train ticket booth at the back, uh, after the service, you can now register your kids for VBS, and then there's, there's a few other sign-up tables just for stuff coming up, so take a look after the service. Um, we are back in the Gospel of John. It's actually been, I think, almost a month or, or over a month before Easter. Uh, if you were here, Pastor David, our church planning pastor from Dawson Creek, he unpacked the first half of chapter 10, and then it was Easter, and then we took a three-week break and did a, a marriage series, which hopefully was uh, helpful and impactful for you. But now we are just going to uh, slug our way through the Gospel of John. I've kind of mapped it out, and we should be done, John, by Christmas. Isn't that encouraging? For some of you, you're like, that is so long. Just if you were here years ago, it took us three years to go through Matthew. So we are flying. Uh, and so I'm very excited to be back in uh, this book. It's a great book of the Bible. Um, John chapter 10, the first half, if you remember, Jesus was using this imagery and, and David unpacked it for us. He talks about the fact that he's the door and then he talks about that he's the good shepherd and it was all of this shepherding imagery as, as he kind of explained uh, who he was. And so now we're going to be looking at verse 22 to the end of the chapter. So I just want to read the first couple of verses because it, it sets up um, the confrontation that we're going to see, which if, you're, if you've been studying John, you're like, big surprise. It's like every passage, Jesus is in trouble again, and it's just so good. So verse 22, this is what it says. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So there's the setup, right? So, so you might be wondering, okay, well, where are we in the timeline here? Because this feast is mentioned, the feast of dedication. And if you know your Bibles, you'll probably recognize that that is actually not listed anywhere in the Old Testament. This is not a a feast or a celebration or a ceremony that God ordained through, through Moses. Um, the Feast of Dedication um, was an eight-day celebration, and what they were celebrating was the rededication of the temple that had taken place in 164 BC. So if you know, they had kind of been conquered and there was all of these abominable things that were taking place in the temple. And uh, uh, the, you've probably heard of the Maccabean Revolt. This is what it was. They kind of took it back and then they dedicated the temple again. Um, this is what Jews today called Hanukkah. This is, that, this is the same celebration. So it used to be called the Feast of dedication and it took place in December. That's why John mentions that it was winter time. And so this, this eight-day celebration, this eight-day feast is going on. So what that means is that between verses 21 and 22, it's been about two months. And I know that as we read it, it just goes, well, it just seems like it happened the next day, but there's been a, a, about a span of, of two months that have gone by. The last confrontation and the last kind of chunk of scripture that we looked at was during the Feast of Tabernacles, which, which always took place sometime in October. And now we're at Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication that takes place in December. So two months has gone by. And we're told that Jesus is walking in the temple in the colonnade of, of Solomon, which is just kind of this covered part of, of the temple that you could uh, meet in. And uh, actually, it's interesting, the early church, that's where they often met. In the beginning of Acts, you'll, hear, uh, you'll read about them meeting in the colonnade of Solomon. That's where they, they taught and discussions took place. And the Jews, meaning the religious leaders, gather around Jesus, right? That's what verse 24 says. The Jews gathered around him. Now, here's what's fascinating. That phrase literally means that they closed in on him. 
So it's not like a, a fun, hey, gather around, everybody. It's literally we're encircling you and we're trapping someone. We're, we're, we're closing in on them so they can't get away. So picture that. This is already a, a hostile situation. The Jews are, are closing in on Jesus. He can't escape. And this is their question. Don't keep us in suspense any longer. Are you the Messiah? Just like, out with it, Jesus. Are you the Messiah? Tell us plainly. So what they mean by that is don't use metaphors. Don't talk about the door and the sheep and the shepherd. No, 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 no. They wanted to hear Jesus say, I am the Messiah. So there's, the, the, don't do miracles. Don't do signs. Just flat out tell us, Jesus, are you the Messiah? And the rest of the chapter is, is Jesus answering them. So three things that I, I want to pull from Jesus' response by way of, okay, how does this actually impact us? One, have you heard his voice? Two, do you know that you're in his hands? And three, do you marvel at his teaching? So as we go through just three things, right? Have you heard his voice? Do you know you're in his hands? And do you marvel at his teaching? So here's how Jesus first responds, verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you. Isn't that great? <laughs> I told you. And you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Right? So here's Jesus, uh, uh, his initial response. Tell us, Jesus, if you're the Christ, the Messiah. And he, he starts by saying, well, I've already told you. Right? And, and you won't believe. Now, to be fair, Jesus has never actually flat out told them I am the Messiah. If you remember in John 4, when Jesus interacts with the Samaritan woman, he kind of flat out tells her, right? When she says, well, once the Messiah comes, he'll, he'll explain everything to us. And he says, well, I who speak to you am he. So he's basically, he flat out told the Samaritans that he was the Messiah. But he's never done that with the religious leaders. But, but he's done so many works that should have been proof enough, right? He's, I mean, he says that. He says, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness about me. So think about what we've seen so far, the healing of the blind man, the, the healing of the man who couldn't walk, all the teaching that Jesus has done. Basically, he's saying, listen, everything that I've done is proof enough. And then verse 26, here's why, uh, despite all of this proof, they won't believe. Verse 26, he says, but you do not believe because you're not among my sheep. Now, I want you to notice, Jesus didn't say, you're not a, a part of my flock because you don't believe, right? Jesus doesn't say, you're not among my sheep because you're not believing in me. He says, you don't believe in me because you're not my sheep. Now, the order of that matters. We might go, well, isn't that semantics? No, 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 no. The order matters. The reason that the religious leaders, these Jewish people weren't believing in Jesus is because they weren't his sheep. So then we ask, well, what comes first, right? Believing in Jesus or being a sheep? And here's what this means. God is the one that must first give someone, grant them the ability to believe. God is the one who gives people a new heart so that they can believe. And, and we've seen this a bunch of times already in the Gospel of John, and we'll continue to see it. So for instance, John 6, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So I mean, Jesus has already said a few chapters ago, people don't just wake up and go, you know what? I think I'm going to follow Jesus. He says, that's not how it works. You come to me because God is the one that's, that's drawing you. In a few chapters in John 15, Jesus says this to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And, and, and we could look at a bunch of other places, but we, we won't. So here's, here's why this helps us make sense of the gospel of John. 
as we're, as we're going through these chapters, we see, uh, we see groups of people who are, are face-to-face with so much evidence of who Jesus is, like an overwhelming amount of evidence, and yet they continue to reject him. I mean, Jesus miraculously feeds probably close to 15,000 people at once. Jesus, you know, walks on water. Jesus heals a, a man paralyzed for his whole life, and, he, and the guy stands up and walks around. Jesus, uh, uh, the chapter before, heals a man blind from birth, which we're told had never happened in the history of humanity. And so sign after sign after sign, and then all of Jesus teaching, and yet we see people go, nah, he's not it. He's not the Messiah. Nope, we don't like him. He's blaspheming. And we look at it and we go, how could they miss it? They aren't his sheep. And then the most unlikely people respond. The blind man, for instance. The Samaritan woman. An entire Samaritan village responds. And they believe because they are his sheep. My sheep... Right, Jesus says, those whom Jesus has called, in verse 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, lots of times that verse is taken out of context, and it's kind of presented as, well, you should be audibly hearing the voice of Jesus. Look, his sheep hear his voice. This is about salvation. It has nothing to do with an ongoing voice that you hear. And unfortunately, it's used like that, and then ordinary Christians like you and me go, I've never heard the audible voice of God. Maybe I'm not a good enough Christian. That's not what this means. Jesus is talking about salvation. He's looking at the Jewish leaders, and he says, you don't believe in me because you're not my sheep, but my sheep hear my voice, right? The call to salvation. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and what? And I know them. I know who they are, and then they follow me. Um, I don't know, it, some of you might not resonate with this, but growing up, um, believe it or not, I kind of grew up even before cell phones were really popular. Some of you are like, how? You look so young. Um, but in my day and age, I remember when my dad got his first cell phone, and it was like the brick that had the antenna that you had to pull out or else it didn't work, right? And then you could angrily slam the antenna down, and we don't do that anymore. But I didn't have a cell phone. No one that I knew had a cell phone growing up. Uh, especially kids. Of course, we didn't have cell phones. We still had. I remember when we got uh, a, a cordless home phone, and that blew my mind. Um, so growing up, then a lot of times uh, I, I had some friends in our in our neighborhood. I remember my my um, neighbor Ian, and we would just go out and play. And it was kind of like, okay, well, just be home by dinner, right? Some of you are like, that. Yeah, I remember that. It was great. But here's what would happen around dinner time. We would have a group of friends, and we're at the park, and we would be playing, and then we would hear in the distance, right, dinner time, and it'd be like, Ian, your mom's calling you, or Ian would go, that's my mom, I gotta go, and then I would hear, dinner, and I'd be like, that's, that's me, that's my mom, I gotta go, and they, our moms didn't even have to say our names, we just knew, and then if it got louder, then you really, like, you better run home, <laughs> man. But we knew our parents' voice. They didn't even have to say our names, right? We heard the voice of our parent. We go, I got to go. Like, that's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, my sheep, they know my voice. They, they hear the call and they come to me. So this brings up an interesting um, theological debate, it brings up the topic of election. And the doctrine of election is basically this. Election is an act of God in which he chooses people to save, not based on anything in that person, any merit in them. It's not because they deserve it more than someone else, but solely based on God's sovereign good pleasure. And what the Bible does is the Bible holds the sovereignty of God and human free will in this marvelous, frustrating tension, if we're honest. I mean, the the Bible, all throughout the Bible, there's this mystery to it. You go all the way back to Exodus, and God says, you know what, Moses, I am actually going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he won't let you go. And you go, well, wait a second, that doesn't seem fair. And then we're told throughout Scripture, sometimes God hardens his heart, and sometimes Pharaoh hardens his own heart. So you see sovereignty and, and 
human free will operating at the same time, and you go, well, how does that work? There's this mystery in Scripture, but the Bible holds both to be true at, at the same time. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, right? They hear my call. I'm calling people to salvation, and yet in the very same verse, he says, and they follow me. So, God, God calls people, and yet they decide to follow him, Jesus chooses us, and yet we choose Jesus. But the question then is, well, who's the one that initiates in this relationship? And we see over and over in Scripture, God is the one who initiates. Does God choose us, or do we choose Him, right? And the answer biblically is yes. But you would never have chosen God unless He chose you. Now, my first draft of the sermon, I then went into like 12 examples of New Testament scriptures that supported this, but I thought that's too much. So I want to give you a couple that, that clearly kind of lay this out for us. In Acts 13, the, the, the gospel is being preached and people are hearing it and they're responding and it says this in verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, meaning the gospel, when they heard the gospel, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And look at this. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So who believed? Those whom God had chosen. Even um, a later, later on in the book of Acts, it talks about Lydia hearing the gospel. And it says that God opened Lydia's heart to respond to the gospel. So did Lydia choose the gospel? Yes. Amen. But God was the one that opened her heart so she understood and, and wanted to believe. Ephesians 1 says, even as he chose us, this is speaking of God, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Think about, think about that. Before even the, the foundation of the world was made, if you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, God chose you. Before God in Genesis 1 spoke anything into existence, he said, yeah, I'm, they're going to follow me. Yes, they're going to hear the gospel and respond. Yes, I'm going to soften their heart and give them salvation. And, and like we could go on and on and on, literally dozens of passages but for sake of time, we won't. But it's all over the New Testament. God choosing people, not based on anything to do with us. It's unmerited. It's unconditional. It's not that God looked at me and said, Andrew's going to be a pretty great guy. I'm going to gift him salvation. No, it has nothing to do with any of us. Now then, the question logically comes up, well, this, does that mean that I don't have free will? Wait a second. Is my life just kind of fatalistic and all my choices are, are just fake and they're not real and they don't matter? And I would answer with, with a, resound, a resounding, no, your choices do matter. You do have free will. Life is not just fatalistic and, and, and we're not just robots in a system or whatever you want to think, whatever illustration works. Scripture is clear. You come to Jesus. You follow him. You confess and believe that he's Lord. Those are decisions that you make. And on the flip side, you are held accountable if you don't believe. And so there's mystery. Listen, I, I don't know how sovereignty and free will go together, but Scripture says they do. There's a, there's a, a grand mystery to it. Now here's where the problem is, humanly speaking then. We often look at our situations and we use mere human logic and then we decide what God can or can't do. Because I already know some of your thoughts are, that's not fair. God's not allowed to do that. Because I remember wrestling with those same thoughts. I go, that doesn't seem fair. I think that I would do a better job. But, but look through the Bible. Anytime someone questions God and his goodness and his character and his plan specifically, how does it usually go? They usually repent afterwards. <laughs> Think of Job. Job is going, man, if I could just talk to God and present my case, we could straighten this out. And God shows up, and God's basic answer to Job is, um, did you create everything? And Job goes, you're right, I repent. I'm not God. Think about Habakkuk. When, when Habakkuk is complaining about the situation in Israel, and God says, listen, buddy, uh, if I told you what I was doing behind the scenes of human history, you wouldn't even believe me. 
You wouldn't even understand what I'm accomplishing. Um, even in Romans chapter 9, Paul presents this, this, this picture of a piece of clay arguing to the potter and going, it's not fair that you're doing this. And basically, Romans 9, Paul says, who are you to question God? So there's mystery. Like, I get it. There, there's mystery in this topic. But think about Christianity. There's a lot that is mysterious. There's, 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 you get to a certain point with logic and reason, and then that's where faith comes in, where you go, yeah, it brought me this far, but I, I still have to make a step of faith to believe this. Think about um, the person of Jesus. Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. Logically speaking, we go, that doesn't make any sense. And yet the Bible holds both. He, he is fully God and fully man, and so we reason, and then we get to a point where we go, I have to believe this by faith. Think about the Trinity. God is one God, and yet he exists as three persons. And we go, that's impossible. And yet the Bible clearly teaches that. So you get to a point where reason brings you, and then you go, I have to believe this by faith. So the doctrine of election is actually, to me, it hasn't become a stumbling block anymore. It's actually been a massive comfort to me. Because here's why. Paul in Romans 8 says, man, God predestined you. He called you, he justified you, he glorified you. Like God has done so much for you. And then the rest of Romans 8 is, Paul says like, who can be against you, Christians? Who can bring a charge against you? What can separate you from his love? Like look what he's done for you. So the doctrine of election is comforting because we go, look at everything that God has done for me. He chose me, he called me, he predestined me, he adopted me, he justified me. No one can touch me. Do what you want, world. Look at what God has done for me. So it's, this doctrine is so comforting. Jesus, his, his sheep hear his voice. He knows them. And they follow him. So have you heard the voice of the shepherd? Like Jesus is the one that calls us. So have you responded to him? Right? And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where you feel this. I I, I mean, uh, there's been times when I've been at uh, events and the gospel is preached. And then you see that person stand up and respond. You're like, that guy? That is the call of God, right? And it's like, I have to go and respond to Jesus. I must give my life to him. Some of you, I know that you've experienced that. This undeniable tug and pull at your heart where you go, I I must listen to the voice of Jesus. And some of you maybe haven't ever experienced that. Right? And you've maybe, maybe you've heard the call of the gospel, but you've just went, nah, I'm okay. Right? And, and like Scripture would say, hey, today if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Are you following Jesus? Have you heard His voice? Do you know it? Jesus then continues in verses 28 and 29, and the good news, the good news just kind of piles on. He says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. He says, I give them eternal life. They will never perish And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. See, I mean, you talk about good news. Not only does Jesus call us, right? He gives us salvation. He draws us. But then Jesus says, I actually give them eternal life. They're going to live forever. They're never going to perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. So, right, we, this passage brings up the doctrine of election, and then it brings up the doctrine or the idea or the theology of eternal security, the perseverance of the saints. Are you and I going to make it to the end? It's the idea that, well, if God is the one that chooses us initially, and we respond to Him, and He's the one that opens our hearts, and He gives us eternal life, am I going to make it? Now, unfortunately, this, I, this, this, this theology has been twisted and almost in a, like a mocking way where it's kind of presented as, oh, once saved, always saved. 
And I've only ever heard that from people who are critiquing it, going, oh, so what you're saying is that you believe, I'll just say this prayer and it doesn't matter how you live because you're in and your life doesn't matter. And if you just say the prayer, then for sure you'll make it to the end. That is not what this theology teaches. That is a twisted version of it. Jesus is the one who makes us endure. The Christian life is not just you having your teeth gritted, white-knuckling it, trying to hold on until the end. Can a person be saved and then live however they want? Well, of course not. We would never say that. We would never say someone who lived in rebellion against God their whole lives. Well, they said a prayer 50 years ago, so they're in. No, of course not. Eternal security doesn't encourage careless living. It's it's a motivation for holy living. Jesus is the one who's going to sustain you to the end. I mean, 1 Peter 1.5, he's talking about us, the church, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Who's, Who's guarding us? Is it you guarding yourself? No, it's God's power guarding you. Jude 24 and 25, now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling. Who keeps us from stumbling? He does. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Who's going to do it? Who's going to keep me till the end? Who's going to keep me blameless and sanctify him and sanctify me? He will. Philippians 1.6, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What Paul is saying is God started this in you. He's going to finish it. So eternal security is this, is this idea that God has chosen you. Jesus has given you eternal life. You will not be snatched out of his hand. God will preserve you to the end. And yes, we partner in that and we strive and we remain faithful and we obey. But what Jesus is saying is God is not going to let you go. I remember I lived a significant portion of my early life believing that Jesus, yeah, he had me in his hand, but it's kind of an open hand. And when I sin, man, I'm out. And I have to to prove that I'm worthy to be in Jesus' hand. No, that is not true. That is a lie from the enemy. Jesus goes so far and says, you're in my hand and you're in the Father's hand. It's like this picture of, you can't get out of there. Right? You're in, you're secure in Jesus. He will not let you go. I've even heard it described, well, no one else can snatch you out of Jesus' hand, but you can leave if you want. And I would respond to that and say, do you really think you have strength to sufficiently overpower and outwit our sovereign God? You think you're stronger than God? God is greater than all, Jesus says. There is no force sufficient to sever the relationship between a true believer and God. Now, it's possible to believe in vain, right? We get warnings all throughout the New Testament. There are some who believe in vain. There's pos- it's possible to have a false start, so to speak, right? The parable of the soils. Yeah, it sprouted up, but then it got choked out, so it, it actually wasn't real. Can someone who is called and chosen by God, who trusts and believes in Jesus for salvation, who's been given eternal life by Jesus, is it possible for them to lose their salvation? If the answer is yes, then Jesus is a liar. If the answer is yes, I've been given eternal life by Jesus, I've been called and chosen by him, but I can lose it one day, then Jesus is lying to you when he says, no one can snatch you out of my hand. If any sheep of Jesus ever perished, then Jesus would have been guilty of failing to keep his promise. And we know that's just not possible. So do you know that you're in his hands? Where is your eternal security? 
Um, do you have assurance of faith? And when I ask this question, so many Christians that I interact with actually don't. They're quite scared. And it's, man, I hope I make it in the end. I don't know if I'm actually saved or not. I'm trying my best, and I hope I, I, I make it. Um, one, one summer, I, I did one stint at summer camp, um, and it was at Camp Wajitawin in Ontario. And uh, I went for a week, and actually, I know <laughs> camp ministry is great. I, I hated it as a teen. I was like, this is the worst week of my life. Maybe it's just, I miss my mom or whatever. But I remember that there was, um, a, a rock climbing was uh, an, a, an activity that you could choose, and throughout the week, we practiced on the rock climbing wall in the kind of the main gym area. And then it was like the last day, we're going to go to an actual place, like an actual cliff, a mountainside, and they've set it up, and, and you've been practicing, and now we're going to actually start at the top, and each, each camper is going to like belay down, and then you can just like, you know, play for the afternoon and, and climb. So all week, I'd been climbing in, in this uh, gym on this artificial rock wall and loving it, and then we got to the final day, and we're standing at the top of the mountain, and we're kind of like looking down, and the first people are going, and they're belaying down, and I remember I was the last one, and I had a massive panic attack, and I was like, I'm not doing it, and it was like, no, listen, no student has ever fallen on this mountain, and I'm like, yeah, well, I could be the first, <laughs> and uh, just panicked. I'd been rock climbing all week, but then we were there, and we were outside, and I saw it, and I had, I had no assurance in the counselor. I was like, are you even certified? I had no assurance in the rope. Have these been tested? And I remember I didn't do it. I was the only student who didn't rock climb. Everyone else is having fun. I can hear them laughing. And, and I just said, forget it. I'm not doing it. And finally, the counselor was like, okay, fine. I can't force you. And I sat up there and waited for everyone else to come up. A lot of Christians live their lives like that. It's like we know the truth that I am saved by Jesus, right? I've been practicing on the fake wall, and then life comes, and I go, can I trust this? Am I actually saved? Am I going to fall? Is there anything that I can do to make sure that I'm saved? And, and, and we just live with no assurance of salvation, and then things happen, right? You go through seasons of doubting. You go through seasons of hardship. You go through seasons maybe where you are, are, are disobeying Jesus. And then we go, well, surely I'm not saved anymore. Listen, God the Father has given sheep to Jesus. And those who have been given to Jesus will not fall away. And yes, you will go through seasons where you go, Man, I'm having such a hard time trusting God. Or you'll go through seasons of doubt, but that does not mean that somehow something snatched you out of Jesus' hand. He will not let you go. I mean, I was at a funeral years ago, uh, and, and it was an old colony funeral, and basically, in so many words, the pastor at the, at the end said about this young man who had died, hopefully he did enough. Like, we don't know if he's in heaven or hell. We have no idea. Hopefully, he did enough. And I know so many of you grew up like that. I don't know if I'm saved or not. I hope I am, and I hope I'm doing enough. Listen, if Jesus calls you, and you've trusted in him, and you believe in him, nothing can snatch you out of his hands. Jesus will not lose anyone that the Father has given him. It is a sovereign commitment from the Son of God that he will preserve you till the end. So do you know that you're in his hands? Shouldn't lead to careless living. And actually, I would say if it does lead to careless living and sin, then were you ever actually in his hands? But if it leads to just trust and comfort and assurance... Do you know you're in his hands? And then in verse 30, Jesus makes this unbelievable statement, I and the Father are one. And, and he doesn't mean one person, but he means the, the closest unity of purpose. Jesus' will is identical to the will of the Father. What he means is that the Father and Jesus are one in nature. So what, how I would explain this is that the Father is God, the Son is God, 
but the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. So oneness, when Jesus says oneness, it doesn't just mean one person. It means oneness in unity, oneness in nature. I mean, that's a, that's a massive statement for Jesus to make. He's essentially claiming equality with God. And verse 31, this is how the Jews respond. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy because you being a man make yourself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him who the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the son of God? If I'm not doing the works of, the, of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained and many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. So have you heard the voice of the shepherd? Do you realize that you're in his hand? And then lastly, do you marvel at his teaching? I mean, the Jews, they wanted to stone Jesus because in their minds, it, he was blaspheming. And, he, and they said, we're not, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna kill you because of the works that you're doing. We're, we're gonna kill you because you are a man and you're claiming to be God. And how Jesus answers them is beyond brilliant. And, and he actually quotes Psalm 82. So if you have a Bible, actually flip to Psalm 82 because this is just amazing how Jesus responds to them. Um, he quotes part of Psalm 82. So if you read... Uh, uh, Verse 1 of Psalm 82, it says this, God has taken place, taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And some of you right away are like, uh, gods? Wait a second. I thought there was only one God. Like literally in, in Hebrew, it says Elohim has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. And you go, wait a second. Uh, this is kind of messing with my brain a little bit. Psalm 82 could be, there's, there's several interpretations. It could be human judges that the psalmist is, is calling gods, little g gods. It could be just human judges, or it could be these divine creatures, this divine council that, that exist um, who throughout Scripture calls gods as well. But what Jesus quotes in, in, from Psalm 82 is verse 6. It says, I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. So what Jesus is doing is he's, he's making an argument from lesser to greater. And it was common in Jewish, you know, uh, rabbinic culture. They would often do, well, if this is true, well, then this greater thing is also true. So what Jesus is getting at, I mean, we could spend a whole sermon on Psalm 82. It's fascinating. But what Jesus is getting at, he says, if sometimes Scripture calls things that aren't God, gods, right? If these are human judges or if these are just divine beings and for the sake of argument, God says, well, they're gods, how much more then do I have the right, because I've been sent by God, to call myself the Son of God? He says, am I really blaspheming? Your own, your own scripture, other people are called gods, and they're judged by the one true God. If human judges or divine creatures or whatever they are, in their roles as representatives of God, if they were called Elohims, then surely that title is appropriate for Jesus. So the point of, of, of Jesus' argument is that logically the Jews could not accuse Jesus of blasphemy based on Psalm 82, because if they did, then, then, then they would be saying that we don't believe Scripture. Psalm 82 is wrong. And, and Jesus knew that they would never do that. So again, if you think, I mean, Jesus just checkmated them again. He says, wait, wait a second. Scripture can't be broken. You know Psalm 82. 
So if God calls them gods, why are you freaking out that I call myself the son of God? And this obviously frustrates them and makes them angry, and they want to arrest Jesus. But yet again, in verse 39, he escapes from them. And then we're told to conclude this passage that Jesus goes across the Jordan. He remains there. He teaches there. People are drawn to him, and we're told that many believe in him. Right? Jesus has a lot of sheep across the Jordan. Many hear him, and they believe. And I mean, some of the things they say are just so encouraging. that They say, you know, John the Baptist, he didn't do any signs, but everything that John the Baptist has said about Jesus is true. And they believe in Jesus. So do you, when you read the Gospels, do you marvel at the teachings of Jesus? Jesus is the greatest teacher who ever lived. No one could trap him. No one could outsmart him. Jesus is, is brilliant. And if you read all the Gospels, you'll see attempt after attempt after attempt. People trying to trip Jesus up in seemingly unanswerable questions. And Jesus just checkmates them over and over. And over. I mean, he is brilliant. Jesus is an unbelievable teacher. Like when you read the Gospels, do you see that? Do you go, Jesus is the greatest teacher who ever lived? Um, I know lots of people who, I, I call it fanboying or fangirling over preachers in the, the church today, right? Um, and and God, God bless them. I mean, God gives really gifted preachers and teachers to the church today. And, and I know when I talk with some people, it's like, man, John MacArthur is the greatest preacher who ever lived. I'm like, okay, great, but wrong. Um, or, or like, man, Andrew's so great at preaching. Thank you. Uh, I, no one has ever said that. Um, or, you know, whoever it is, right? Or Charles Spurgeon, he's called the prince of preachers. Do you know why he's called the prince of preachers? Because Jesus is the king of preachers. <laughs> But we do that. I remember my, one of my mentors, Mark Birch, and some of you have, have met him before. He's been up here. But we worked at Maple Ridge uh, Baptist Church uh, together for two years. And I remember he, he, he preached through the book of Romans for two years. And I remember I'm on staff. I'm a youth pastor. And I'm sitting week after week in church. And for two years, I like wept every Sunday. Just going, I have never heard the Bible explained like this. And I was like, am I, was I even a Christian before? Like, I feel like I'm understanding the gospel for the first time for two years. Like, he, my, Mark is such a, a gifted preacher and teacher. But what I'm saying, any, anyone that you lift up and go, man, they're amazing. They look like preschoolers compared to Jesus. He's the, he's the most brilliant teacher who has ever lived. And so when we read the gospels, it should invoke in us a sense of awe and wonder where we go, I can't, I, can't, I can't even wrap my mind around. This is so brilliant. It should astound you. It should bring you to tears. It should awaken your soul. I mean, this is our shepherd. So have you heard his voice? And he chose you. He knows you by name. Are you following him? Don't, don't get caught up in trying to solve the mystery of the sovereignty of God and, and free will, because you never will. But have you heard his voice? Do you know you're in his hands? Right? When you go through seasons of sickness and trial and doubt and pain and failure, do you know that you know that you know that you are in the hands of Jesus? He will not let you go. And do you marvel at his teaching, where you go, man, I just want to follow, I just want to do what Jesus says because he's brilliant. So, Father, I thank you for your word. Um, it is such a comfort to us. Um, God, I, I thank you that before the foundation of the world, you chose us. And, and I will confess, I, I don't understand all the intricate workings of your sovereignty and my choosing to follow you but man, it is a comfort. When I know that before you made anything, you chose us in Christ. That when we heard the gospel and we responded in belief, it's because your spirit was, was already there, softening our hearts, opening our eyes. 
Again, God, you are so good to us. You would be completely just in saving no one. And we all deserve hell. And yet, God, you are so good that you, you give us the gift of faith and repentance and trust. And then we respond to you. Jesus, for those in this room that maybe have never heard your voice, God, I pray that you would speak to them, soften their hearts. God, would they feel the tug of your spirit calling them, that they wouldn't resist it, that they would follow you, Jesus. I pray for those in this room who are going through seasons of doubt and maybe even sin and wandering away and Jesus, I pray that they would know that, that, that if they have decided to follow you, that they are in your hands. Nothing can snatch them out. And that, that, that would invoke in us not a desire to live carelessly, but it, it would invoke in us a desire to live holy lives because we're in your hands, Jesus. So we just marvel at who you are. We marvel that no one could back you into a corner theologically. No one could trip you up, Jesus. Um, you are the greatest teacher who ever lived. And I pray that every time we gather and every time we open the Word, that we, we would just be in awe of who you are. So would you encourage us and comfort us through your Spirit that we would leave just fully assured that if we've heard your voice, if we've responded, then we are in your hands. And what can separate us from your love? And Paul says a resounding nothing. And that we would live with that kind of confidence and assurance, Jesus. And so I just pray this all in your mighty name. Amen.